daughter. God love her heart. Thank you, Dean, for coming to the rescue. Amen. Turn, if you will, to Nahum chapter 1. Listen, I was driving to work this week, and uh, I come across that, talking about singing and knowing a song, uh, it was God is good all the time. And I thought, wow, yeah, God is good. God is good. You know, and I always listen and try to listen to the Lord because it's through many different ways that God speaks to me about what I'm supposed to preach about. I listen to conversations that I have with you and maybe a bill will go off and so you'll say something. I'll say, you know what, that's, that's good. You know, so maybe you'll make a statement. Uh, like uh, Joanne telling uh, Kenneth to stay off the roof. Uh, there's a message in there, Joanne. Stay off the roof. I'll come up with it later on. You just don't worry about it. But, but you know that thing of the Lord is good, just God is good, you know, all the time when we say that. I, I came to work on Monday and I thought, well, you know, okay, Lord, great, you're good. But I need some verses and I... I need, I need something to go by. I need an outline. And finally, I said, just kind of sit out there. And I thought, well, okay, Lord, you're good. I'll start working on Wednesday night's Bible study. <laughs> and, uh, but as, as the day went on, matter of fact, I called my wife and I told her, I said, you know, what, what, pray for me. I mean, well, how do you preach? God's good. Now, I know you're sitting there, oh, preacher, that's easy. Well, it, not when you try to put it down, but... Anyway, I, I came, I, as I was studying, I, I came across probably one of the most powerful four words found in this verse. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. And Nahum is probably the last minor prophet, we call him a minor prophet, just because they are not as big, I guess, as Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. But it doesn't mean that the message that he preached was any less. But as I, I read over now, as a matter of fact, I Bible Gateway Googled it, and because uh, I was looking for verses that says God is great, and I came across several. But when I read about Nahum, I thought of all of the prophets, to be able to speak to the fact that God is good, Nahum would probably be the least of it, because his message was a message of destruction. The children of Israel had gone offline. They, they were not where they were supposed to be. God was using the Assyrian army to bring judgment on them. And, and Nehemiah's message was that of judgment. And I thought, how in the world, Nahum, can you say and preach judgment is coming and then open it up with, well, the Lord is good. Let's look at that verse together. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, right at the beginning, the Lord is good. Say that with me. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. Ah, now I'm beginning to understand. When everything's falling apart, huh? when, when darkness comes, when life isn't going the way that you expected it to, the Lord is good because he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. And here's the other part. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Listen, if you trust in God, if you put your faith, see, faith is built on obstacles. Faith is built on things that have happened to you prior to an event. It scares me when we talk about that, it is when people, we Christians sometimes, seem to fall apart when bad things happen. And we ought to be the most secure individuals when the storm comes. Because we know that God knoweth us. That's what he's saying here. God knows you. He knows you. And if you trust in him, he knows you. And you can go back to the second part. He'll be the strong power, the strong strength, the anchor that holds because you have trusted him in the past. So when the storm comes, you're ready. That doesn't mean the storm's not hard. I don't want to minimize the impact that storms have on their life. Troubles hit us hard. 
Because oftentimes the devil will get them in our life when we're least expected. You know, when we're everything's going good. And you're saying, yeah, God is good all the time. God is good all the time. Yeah, God is good. Then all of a sudden you walk out the door, you know, your car blows up. And you're saying, God is good. Yeah. But you see, the devil chooses the times. Just like this morning. That worship melody worked perfectly. But you see, sometimes the devil wants to come and rob our worship of God. He wants to come and interject. And you say, Pastor, do you really believe that the old devil can actually mess with the computer? Well, let me just say this. He will do anything he can do to interfere in your life. Can it be the automobile? Yes, it can be. Can he get into your uh, uh, plumbing? Brother Charles? Yes, he can. He can get in your plumbing. Anything that he can do to cause you to get distracted and to take your eyes upon Jesus Christ. He'll do it. He'll do it. But you, those of you that have been tested by time, then we can stand up to him and say that Nehemiah said, in the midst of the onslaught of the Assyrian army coming to judge God's people, he can say, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, I, I thought it was interesting in studying that, that Nahum's name means comfort or consolation. Comfort. Boy, isn't it something that we all want in times of trouble? We, we want some comfort. We, we want some comfort. We, we want somebody or something to come along and to give us assurance that we're going to be able to make it through these hard times. And that's what Nahum was. Even though he preached the message of, of judgment, he was there to say, listen, because God is good, because God is a stronghold in a time of trouble, you can trust him. God's going to see you through. You're going to make it. Even though the rivers of waters may seemingly be to overwhelm you, God's going to be there with you, and you're going to make it. You may get wet, but you're not going to drown. You know, the, the storm may blow your hair uh, all over the place, but guess what? It's going to go back again. It's going to be okay. I know Jack and I have that problem, don't we? Yeah. As I studied, I discovered that this book of Nahum, which is a very short one, uh, is a sequel to the book of Jonah. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, let me explain. Uh, about a hundred years earlier, Jonah, as you remember, was sent to the land of Nineveh, or that's what God intended for him to do at the beginning. But now you know that, that Jonah uh, had a little detour. He was trying to run from God, got into a ship, storm, storm. Okay, uh, sometimes storms are to get our attention. Amen. So, so a storm came. Uh, Jonah confessed. The sailors threw him overboard. Big fish swallowed him. And after three days, uh, Jonah had to come to Jesus moment. The, uh, the big fish barked him up on the shores of uh, Nineveh. And there, finally, he went preached. Now, he might have looked horrible. I mean, you get in those digestive juices, and I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> but he went preached. Huh? You know, sometimes we think we can't do things. You know, we keep telling God, I can't do that. Just remember Jonah. He was up chucked on a, the land of uh, Nineveh, and he went and did God's will. Let me tell you something. You'll do God's will when God uh, gets your attention. Yeah. All right? So do his will before he has to get your attention. That's the moral of that story. All right. So when the Ninevites heard the message of Jonah, they repented of their sins, and the Lord spared the city. Now, a uh, hundred years later has passed, and we see Nineveh back again in the mess that they were before. God's judgment was about ready to come on him. Now, they had forgotten. They had forgotten the commitments and the promises that they had made to God. Now, church, we can relate to that. Uh, many of us uh, have fallen away from where we ought to be. 
we get saved and satisfied and comfortable and, you know, we go through the motions of church, but nothing Pastor Art says or nothing that the deacons say or nothing the Sunday school teacher says or nothing the Word of God says is going to faze us because, after all, we know everything anyway. Kind of like your kids when they're teenagers, you know? When you try to say, don't do that, but because they're 13, they know more than you, where did they get that education? You know, uh, like I said, I believe, you remember the movie The Body Catchers or Snatchers? Remember, uh, people would go to sleep and they'd wake up. Well, they wouldn't wake up. But, but a body that looked like theirs, you know, would come out of that pod and that they would come out and, you know, the movie. Some of you looking at me. Right? Well, it's, it's been out about three different versions of it. Go, go Google it or YouTube and you'll know what I'm talking about. But anyway, these people would come out. Well, that's what happens when, when our kids become teenagers. It's like, you know, most of the time they're these loving, caring, you know, mommy and daddy can never say anything wrong. You know, they're just full of wisdom. You know, they write you little notes telling you how great you are. Then all of a sudden, the body stature comes, some pod somewhere, and this 13-year-old comes out, and you're looking and saying, what alien came down and got you? Because all of a sudden, you're stupid. You don't know nothing, and I know everything. And, and so that's, that's kind of the way we get, folks, after we've been in church for a while. We forget that God is awesome. We forget that God is good. We forget that God is omniscient. We forget that God is sovereign, and He is God, and He always knows best. He always knows best for us. And when God sends storms or troubles, a lot of times it's because we've gotten our eyes off of Him, and we're not paying attention to His words anymore because we think we know best. After all, we've been saved 25, 30 years, and you know, I'm, I've arrived. I have my own chair. Nobody sits in my chair, so I'm, you know, I, I have status in the church. And uh, so, who, who's God? Well, so, so then when trouble comes, we try to negotiate with God. I, I wrote down some nego negotiations, all right? Uh, here they are. This is our attempt to bar bargain with the sovereign God, all right? Uh, Lord, if you take me through this surgery, I will go to church more often. Lord, if you help me graduate from college, I will go to Sunday school. Lord, if this medical test comes out good, I will tithe like I should. Lord, if you touch the judge tomorrow, I will serve you more diligently. Lord, answer our cry, and we will make changes immediately for you. Unfortunately, after a few months, we get right back into that formal state. Not always. Not always. Sometimes we do. Nahum's message was Nineveh would be destroyed. And sadly, these people had not passed down the knowledge of what had happened in Jonah's day. Now, now church, let me say something. We have a responsibility to pass down. You adults, you have a responsibility to pass down God's love and His grace and how great He is to your children and to your grandchildren. And, and, but time... Time went on, and they forgot God. Israel, God's people, as time went on. Let me give you a couple of verses here this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, insomuch as more as you see the day approaching. Why is this verse so important to our Christian growth? It is by assembling together with our family and our children that we are reminded of the miracles of God. Folks, listen, it's good to come to church and share with one another the things that God has done for us. That's why on Wednesday night we have an opportunity, after we've said our prayer request, to have a praise time. And I, 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 I would just hope that we would continue to come ready to share, share something God has done in your life. Because I don't know about you, but God is active in my life every day. Every day there is a miracle taking place. The thing about it is, is I may not know about it. I mean, who's to say 
that uh, when I was driving to church here this morning, that some individual may have crossed over the middle line and hit me head on. It would have been a different Sunday morning, would it not? Now, I don't know about you, but if God would kind of give me a little uh, a flash of that, boy, I tell you what, we would all come in here and I could say, listen, folks, I'm here today, I'm not in the emergency room, or I'm not dead, because God diverted a car from hitting me this morning. Amen. Well, you'd be praising God, wouldn't you shout? Well, listen, it could happen. And more than likely, it probably could have happened. That's why we need to be thanking God and praising God all the time. We need to be happy because He loves us, because God is good, and because God will take us through the hardship. I know when we're going through the hardship, it's hard to shout, praise the Lord. But that's the time when you need to shout, praise the Lord. It's when you're facing the difficulty in trial in life. And that's what Nahum was doing. When he began the verse by saying the Lord is good, that he is a strong tower, a stronghold. Church, I hope that you and I can do that. So let me just give you here something. Here's what I love about Nahum. E even during this tragedy, Nahum was able to see and understand the grace of God. That, that, that stuff that we don't deserve. That unmerited favor. Grace. He, he got a hold of it. You, you see, because Nahum because he had trust in God, because he knew that the Lord was good. And, and church, let me tell you something. Because God is good, he will use things in your life always to bring about good in your life. No matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, just know that God is going to take that, whatever it was, and he's going to turn it out for good in your life if you'll let him. If you'll keep your eyes upon Him, if you'll keep focusing and praising and proclaiming that God is good in the midst of it all, just know that God is going to work it out. You can have the faith, see, that God is going to see you through this thing. And so Nahum understood that. That's the message in Nahum's prophecy was that he understood that the grace is the love of God that is shown when we're unlovely. Jesus died on Calvary while we were yet sinners. Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus died on the cross knowing that you were a sinner. But the reason that he died on the cross was because you are a sinner and he loved you and he didn't want to have you die. That's why I love that song, Mercy Walked In. Because every one of us Romans tells us we were guilty of sin. And the penalty for that sin is death. And I'm not talking about just dying. I'm talking about eternal death. If without from the, without from the mercy of Jesus Christ applied to our life, if it wasn't for the mercy where Jesus walked into the eternal courtroom, as I said earlier, and he proclaims, Father, I paid the price for Art Cipher's sin. I died. My blood that was shed was like the lamb that was slain and the blood was applied on the mercy seat representing the covering of atonement for the sins of the people. God pardons us because mercy walked in. Because mercy said I paid the price. Grace is the peace of God that is given to the restless. In other words, if you understand God and you understand His purpose and you understand His reasoning, uh, well, first of all, that may be high because His thoughts are high above our thoughts. So I just got to trust in God that I can hang on to myself. I may not understand all the mechanics, all the workings of things. I don't understand what goes on down in John the Power. Now, those of you that may have worked there, you may have a better understanding than I do. But all I know is when I go to my light switch, Lights come on. That's all I need to know. Church, you stand in the need of grace. All you need to do, you need to have pain, peace and confidence knowing that God is there to give you that peace. Grace is a free sovereign favor to the ill deserving. You know, I, I just keep thinking, you know, God's grace reached down to me when I needed it the most. And one thing we need to understand, grace 
is most needed and best probably understood when we're in the midst of suffering and brokenness. Well, I tell you what, that's when we need it. And that's when we understand it. So many times we fail. We fail to see the abundance of God's grace that is found in His love. Anybody, church, anybody can mess up along the journey of life. But there is grace. Anybody can make bad decisions. But guess what? Grace will help you fix it. Anybody ever lean on your understanding instead of the Lord's and found yourself in bad shape? I have. But I should lean not into my own understanding. I should lean to the Lord and trust because God is good. Now I want you to know about this great and wonderful God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 says, and it relates to the goodness of God. It says, He maketh the sun to shine on the evil and on the good. And He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now I know sometimes it's easy to think, well God, why am I going through this? when so-and-so doesn't seem to be going through anything. Or it's easy, church, for us Christians to look at people in the world and say, well, well how come it's not fair, God, that, that if they want a Starbucks coffee, that they can hire a private jet, or they want a, 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 a Nathan's hot dog, and, and have it flown across the country, you know, pay thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, and all I want to do is pay my $150 water bill. You, you see, it's easy to sometimes think, well, as a Christian, I, I'm being mistreated by God. That, that I, I, I'm not getting God's favor. But, but can I say something to you to put it all in, in, in priority and context? Let, let them movie stars live in four or five mansions. Malibu, Jamaica, wherever they want to build a multi-million dollar let them live like that. Yeah, let them live like that. They can live like that all the days of their life. But guess what? When my life is over, and their life is over, and all they've lived for is their stuff, and they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I guarantee, I, I'll tell you this, I won't trade places with them, but they'll want to trade places with you remember the rich man and Lazarus when he died and, and, he, and he saw Lazarus up there in the arms of Abraham and he cried out. He, 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 he said, Father Abraham, ju just let Lazarus touch his... I'll guarantee you some that rich man wouldn't have wanted Lazarus to even touch him. Huh? Let alone his own nasty fingers. Don't know where they've been. And yet he said... Father Abraham, let, let Lazarus just touch his finger and, and put just that little bit of moisture in my mouth. Couldn't do it. Folks, let me tell you something. Let the world live the way they live. But I promise you, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, guess what? They'll want what you got. And you know what? They have enjoyed their... You listen to the news and all these stars and notoriety, people, they're dying like flies. 38, 40, whatever. Guess what? When I go to heaven, it's forever. It's for all eternity. I'll get to enjoy the grace and goodness of God forever and ever. Let me give you a last word. Church, God works. He works in our life. Many times we wonder why He would let us go through such yucky and difficult times. But let me say something. God has everything under control. God has everything under control. We may not understand it. We may not know why it's going on the way it's going on. But guess what? God's in control. God knows what He's doing. Amen. Have faith in that. Let me talk to you for a second. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can I invite you this morning to just to say, Father, forgive me. I repent of my sins. 